east of Dallas, a suburban police officer is under investigation for shooting to death an unarmed 15-year-old. The police said today that the officer's story doesn't add Good up. evening. A deadly struggle between police in Louisiana and the man they were trying to arrest, captured on video and shared around the world today, is provoking questions and outrage. Good evening. evening. For the second time in as many weeks, a grand jury has found the evidence is just not there to charge a white police officer in connection with the death of a black Next civilian. New developments in the deadly police shooting of Tamir Rice, the 12-year-old boy shot and killed by police in Cleveland in 2014. This trial has been called in the murder case against a white University of Cincinnati police officer charged in the shooting death of a black man during a traffic stop. Gloria Riviera on the deadlock jury and what's next for a family still seeking justice. For a while it seemed like every time you turned on the television there was a shooting of an unarmed black person. You know some people think that racism has gotten better but it's the 21st century and sadly to say it has not at least if you're a person of color now not everyone is um, getting shot or getting some kind of violence done towards them however profiling is still a thing of today yes we may be able to mask it differently but racism is still racism and police brutality is still here. Think of it this way. An African American woman can walk into a department store on any given Saturday dressed moderately. And when I say moderately, she may have on a jogging suit, um, gym shoes, you know, not in a dress or formal wear. And just because she may be going to purchase a gift that could easily rack up to about six, seven thousand dollars and go up to the cashier to pay for her purchase. Credit card is swiped. It's approved. The cashier calls the police because they automatically assume, based on what she looks like, that she's committing credit card fraud. People, we have got to wake up. Just because she's not dressed in a manner that would suit us as a business, as a legitimate business, she has she has to be someone who is not making a legitimate purchase. We're living in a day and age where how you look matters and it could prove to be dangerous if you are someone of color. It's 2018 and we are still having this conversation. Yes, we may live in better zip codes, we may attend top universities, but Racism is still alive today, and it is well. We have to do something. Why isn't someone, or more people for that matter, standing up to say this is wrong, and I've got to do something about it? This incident took me by surprise. Um, I was a young African-American student on paper I looked great um, great great had a good job um, was in a cooperative program with my high school and everything seemed to look well I think sometimes you know as African Americans we can get to a point where a lot of times people want to say oh you think you're white uh, it's not that you think you're white but I think sometimes we can get comfortable um, being in a good zip code, going to a good school district, and we may forget until we too must be woken up. And I think it was this day for me, I was very excited. I was a senior in high school. I'm going to college. I had been accepted to the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I purchased myself a Cadillac. And I was very excited, you know, I was um, 17 years old. I was working for a leasing company, a private leasing company. And I had talked to my boss and told him, you know, hey, I'm thinking about switching up my car before I go off to school. I kind of want something a little bit more roomier than what I had. And he told me, he says, you know, when my son went to college, he had a Cadillac. I think it's a phenomenal car. I think you should have one. Now, this is an older white man talking to a young African-American teen, and I'm thinking, well, if it was good enough for his son, it's good enough for me. 
And so I got the car and I remember I was just excited. I had went to the dealership. I had signed all the paperwork at the office before going to the dealership. I took the tags off my old car. My boss was like, just take the tags, put them on your new car. I'm headed to the county clerk's office. I'm gonna get everything swapped around for you. We'll get um, the paperwork done and you'll be good to go. So here's me, go off um, to the dealership. I go up there and I remember the guy, it was a white gentleman that I saw when I walked through the door. He says, that's a mighty fine car you're getting there. And I says, oh, thank you. And so I got the keys, gave him the check. I got the car. I was on my way. I was excited. This was something that I felt I had accomplished for me. And I was driving and I remember looking in the rearview mirror and seeing the blue lights. And I thought to myself, hmm, what could this be about? I hadn't done anything wrong. And so I pulled off the expressway and I pulled over and I pulled over to a residential road um, off the exit. And the police officer comes up, I see him coming up to the window. And so I got my registrations and everything prepared, wrote my window down. And I'm thinking, you know, cause when you, as an African-American male, we're taught, you know, when the police pull you over, you gotta do da 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 da. So I'm ready to give him license and registrations. First thing out of his mouth was, boy, where did you get this car? And I'm like, okay, that's kind of not what, the way I thought this was gonna play out. And I knew by his tone, instantly, I knew where he was going. I, I just, I knew by the tone. First of all, you called me boy. Where did you get this car? Okay, so now I've stolen the car in his mind. And so he says, the next thing out of his mouth, because I'm still, I have license and registration. I'm ready to give license and registration. He says, the tags on your car, are not for this, they're for an SUV. And I'm like, oh, my boss must have forgot to go straight to the county clerks or he hadn't had a chance to get there yet. So I'm thinking, oh, this is a simple fix. So I looked at the officer and I said, you know, I just got this car. I said, this was a gift purchase to myself and my boss was supposed to be getting the paperwork swapped around for me for my old vehicle to this vehicle. And the, you know, he's looking at me and I says, you know, if you will allow, I don't mind getting him on the phone and allowing you to speak to him um, and he can straighten all this out. And you know, to this day, I never will know what my boss told this police officer. But one thing that goes through my mind is, what would have happened if the owner of this car had not been white? What would have happened if my boss was not a white man I, I, and you know and what would have happened if i would have had an aggressive tone to this officer from the moment i started interacting with him when he called me boy would i have been a hashtag i don't know and it's sad that that was almost 10 11 years ago but we're in 2018 and we're still dealing with some of the, the same things, just in different types and different formats. Just because it's not somebody coming up to you, calling you boy, um, now it's another news story or another hashtag. Um, or it's, it's just, it's so many things that are going on that are alarming, but my, my mind just always goes back from my own personal story I just want to know if everybody in the scenario had been black, what would we be saying about me today? And that's an interesting take. But we also want you to know that all police officers, all security personnel are not profiling. Mm -hmm. All of them are not bad. Mm -hmm. As someone who has someone who is in law enforcement in my family, I think about what goes through their, ment their mind mm -hmm. when they're going out to work every day. Mm -hmm. They still have children, families to come home to that they have to worry about right. every time they go out. Right. So they're also thinking about those things when they pull a, um, a routine stop or right. they have to serve in a actual building as uh, security because they are not just protecting the people that are in that building or even the driver of another car, they also have to protect themselves. Right. 
And I think too, what's interesting, and as we talk about it, I don't think all police are bad, I, I don't. I also think too, it's interesting um, I know that we wanted to have an actual police officer on this one, mm -hmm. but I know that, you know, due to rules and regulations and policies, that's not always possible. But I was told by another police officer, he tells his son, mm -hmm. don't trust the police. Mm -hmm. And I, I, felt, I thought, wow, that's like an amazing point of view considering he's, he's a, a police, police officer. officer. Yeah. But, you know, what I often think about it, and because I'm sure people watching may have children, and that's a valid point. What do we tell our children about the police, especially our African American boys um, and girls? But you know, what do we tell them about the police when they go out? You know, I serve as a mentor to a lot of uh, young adults, mm -hmm. and as a mentor, even if I'm not their parental figure, if they were to ask me a question like that. Mm -hmm. I would, my answer and my response to that would be, be respectful. Mm -hmm. Go above and beyond to be respectful. It's not about you um, diminishing your value to be respectful. Right. That doesn't make you any less of a person, or right. less of a human being, or even less in your ethnicity. Right. But it does remind the person that is in law enforcement that this person is not out to get me. This person is not out to harm me right. as a person that's as a person that's here to serve and protect. Right, and uh, you know, for so long, everybody kept saying the goal is to get home. The yes. goal is to get home, and that sounds good, but that also can have a you know a reverse effect mm -hmm. on the individual because you get into this. You're so nervous, and you're so uh, like, is something yeah. going to happen to me? Is something going to happen to me? The goal, I think, too. As African American men, especially, we yeah. have to take responsibility sometimes for the way we portray and show yes. up in the universe. Yes, your pants being all the way down to your knees. Yes. There's no. What What is the point of that? There is no point in that. And I think that sometimes, you know, it. it people can say, "Oh, that's just me. Oh, that's just me." But how are you showing up? I think when we think about police brutality and racism and all of this thing, we still, everything can't be placed the blame on someone else. Right. We still have to look at that little blanket and say, where do we show up in this equation? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the point that I also want to make sure that we bring up too. But what would you say again to that about showing up as a black male, how we show up? It matters. It does matter. And please know that we may not be getting sprayed with water hoses now. Mm -hmm. We may not be um, having dogs sicked on us in this day and age. But like you said, how you look and how you show up matters. Mm -hmm. And it disarms the person that is in law enforcement mm -hmm. when they approach your vehicle mm -hmm. or when they approach you as a person to know that this person is not out to harm me. Right. Because yes, I'm in a position to serve and protect you, but I also have to serve and protect myself. Right. Because I'm still human. Right. And I also think too, and you know, I think that communities, what communities can do, because we want to offer things that can help the mass. Yes. And I think that more city councils, more um, government officials, commissioners and mm -hmm. people, they need to get back to having these conversations with the community yes. on how the African American community can interact with the police because it shouldn't be a them over there and us, us over, over here. here. Mm -hmm. We should be able to work together because here's the thing. I don't care how many hashtags we see. Mm -hmm. I don't care how many police shootings we see that um, do not get resolved. When things happen in the community, we still expect law enforcement to show, to up. show up. Yes. And so we have to find a way to bridge the gap, to talk to both sides of, of, of the equation. And one other thing I would like to say as it relates to racism, you know, we can't, I don't think it's one of those things that will ever go away. I just think the roots are too deep. I think we can do things to make it better. Mm -hmm. I think we can do things to um, 
have each side see, you know. And the, be empathetic. Yeah, be empathetic to the other. But, you know, as someone who was blessed enough to see grandparents live to be 90 plus years old, there were issues that were so deeply rooted there that it was no coming back from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I can't try to change something that they spent 90 years and they went through and they dealt with. I wasn't there. Right. I, I, I didn't deal with that. I didn't deal with water hoses, but see, they didn't deal with the same things that we're dealing with right today. now today. Yeah. And here's the thing. There's always going to be populations that have, and there are always going to be populations that have not. And I think, again, if we just learn to be empathetic and see through the other person's eyes, I think that we can get some form of a resolve. And the story that I wanted to say, the last thing I wanted to say the story was, I worked with a doctor who did a test at a conference mm -hmm. and where they gave, um, they gave construction paper, scissors, glue, they gave all these materials to build things to everybody at the conference. But what they did was they gave certain tables some materials and some some tables had all the materials, other tables had just certain materials, but they wanted everyone to achieve the same goal. Mm -hmm. And I feel a lot of times in our African American community, especially, they want us to achieve the same goals, but we don't have the same resources. all the same resources. Yeah. And yeah. so until we're working with all the same resources, I feel like it's gonna be a revolving door. Yeah. So when I think about everything that we've stated today, mm -hmm. there's some takeaways that I want you to take away from this interaction with us. Mm -hmm. Number one, we're all living the same experience. It's called the human experience. Mm -hmm. And we all have dealt with things in our past, dealing with things presently that could have us in a tumultuous emotional state when it comes to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But we have to remember that they're human beings so too. We <laughs> have to take ownership of being accountable for how we show up to law enforcement as well as to other generations. Because you've stated something that you think it, it may never change, it may never go anywhere. Mm -hmm. I beg to differ. Okay. Because if we teach the younger generation mm -hmm. how to do it better, right. then eventually things will get better. I can agree with that. And, and I definitely can agree with that. And I think another takeaway too um, is we the empathy part. I think we all have to realize everybody is not, everybody doesn't have the same tools at the table. Mm -hmm. And so you know, just because you may have more or less tools, it doesn't give you the right <laughs> to be better or worse than Anybody someone else. else. Yes. So I think if we just all learn to just, just use the E word, simple, just, just use the E word, empathy, and I think we can begin to bridge that gap. I really do. Are you enjoying Perspectives? We know you are, and we wanna hear from you. We're all over social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at David and Johnny. Our YouTube page is David Johnny. And hey, we're right here on realhealthmag.com.